Shalom, good afternoon, I'm happy to be here, getting out of the UN, and I think friends, thank you uh, Malcolm and Stephen for inviting me, I have a lot of good friends in the crowd, I cannot name all of you, but I grew up uh, in the Jewish business, so as a shaliach, I think it was more than 20 years ago, Karen in Florida, when we organized an, an event, and I saw Morton for more than 20 years coming to lecture in Abetar, and Gary, I see so many good friends that you know, uh, and I see my friends from uh, American Friends of Likud. So I really feel at home. You know, in the UN, when you see a large crowd of people gathering to speak about Israel, it is a bad sign. <laughs> but uh, I know here it is not the case. I would like to share with you uh, the chavayot, the experiences we have at the UN. I know all of you are very knowledgeable, very active. We just saw the last statement uh, you made about the Security Council resolution. I'm sorry that I late, but I was at the Security Council until now, and uh, we are dealing with few resolutions regarding Israel as we speak. And uh, indeed, uh, the position today in the UN is not an easy one. I knew it when the Prime Minister offered me to take uh, this position, but uh, as my wife told me, I came in six months ago, I had no gray hair, and, uh, <laughs> and it's coming now. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> First of all, on a personal note, I came from uh, the government. Uh, I was a member of Knesset, Deputy Minister of Defense and Minister of Science and Technology. And in the Knesset, you are used that publicly people speak highly of you. And quietly, sometimes it's different. In the UN, it's completely the opposite. When you speak with them quietly, they appreciate Israel, even admire Israel. But then when they take the podium, it's a, it's a different ball game. And that is uh, my main challenge at the UN to change it, to take the, the private uh, support and uh, admiration to Israel and to make it public. And I think we can do it. It is feasible. Many people talk about uh, the obsession of the UN against Israel and uh, all the resolutions. And it's true. We see the numbers. Uh, in 2015, 22 resolutions against Israel condemning Israel, and zero resolutions condemning the atrocities in Syria. You cannot ignore that. In the debate I just participated now in the Security Council regarding terrorism. So in the last four months, there were 12 resolutions condemning terrorism from California to Jakarta, Brussels, France, but they, not even once they haven't mentioned Israel. What about the 34 victims of terror in Israel? They do not exist. That's what I just said at the Security Council. So yes, there is hypocrisy at the UN. We deal with that day in and day out. But we have some friends also. We have some friends. We have some victories as well. I want to mention two victories. And I know that many of you were very involved with that. First of all, is the decision to recognize Yom Kippur as an official day of the UN. It's an important decision. I was here last Yom Kippur with my family, and President Obama spoke in the General Assembly, and we couldn't go and to attend the meeting. So we, I had to call my colleague, Samantha, Ambassador Samantha Power, and to apologize. So it is important that this year there will be no debates, no voting uh, at the UN, and maybe they will have some time to do some tshuva, to repent for, <laughs> for all, all their sins uh, during that year. But I want to thank uh, Malcolm, you, and, uh, and the leaders here in this room for being so instrumental uh, getting this decision passed. Another important decision that we passed was regarding agricultural technology. We sponsored it, and we got the support of the member states. Interesting enough, the Arab ambassadors, when they spoke, they said it is a great resolution that we are discussing now. We can benefit from that resolution, but because it's coming from Israel, we will not vote for that. Still, we got the support of 146 member states, and it is impressive. So
So he, he showed, and it, it showed that we can make a change, and uh, we should continue to show the real faith of Israel at the UN. That is what I'm doing day in and day out, blocking the attacks, but at the same time, showing the, the real face of, of Israel. And uh, we have a lot to show. I don't need to explain to you uh, that we can be proud of our country. Being the Minister of, of Science and Technology, I can assure you that we will continue to be a startup nation. We are, we are proud of that. And I think that uh, we should do more. And I actually invite all of the organizations here to partner with us and to bring your activities into the UN. If it's up to me, I will have every week an exhibition about Israel, an event about Israel, and, and we're doing a lot. In a Israel Independence Day, we invited the ambassadors from the UN to come to see Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway. That will be the reception we will have for Israel Independence Day. I invite also you to attend this event. At the end of May, we will have a major event regarding BDS in the General Assembly of the UN. And I decided about that. I know you have to excuse me. I'm an Israeli. I know here you plan things way, way in advance. But after I saw the decision that was passed in Geneva a few weeks ago, that a UN organ decided to create a database that will name companies that do business with Israeli companies, actually it will be, everybody will be on that blacklist if you don't know that. Because if you read the decision, it says any company that is doing anything with companies in Judea and Samaria, Golan Heights, and East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem basically it's half of Jerusalem. So let me tell you the news. Aretz newspaper will be in the blacklist because Aretz newspaper is being distributed in uh, Gilo, in Arhoma, in Ramot Shlomo, it's Jerusalem. So basically everything you can think of will be on that list. And you know who will pay for that blacklist? You will pay for that blacklist. There will be funding from the UN for creating that database. So when that resolution passed and Secretary Kerry personally was involved trying to block it, he called before the vote, he called President Abbas and he asked him, don't pass that resolution. You can pass other resolutions that Israel is not happy about, but don't create a, a database today. It didn't work. It passed. That's why I decided that, you know, if, if the UN is being involved officially now, because that list will be under the UN, it will not be another BDS organization that is creating a list. It will be a UN list labeling companies. So I decided to take action and to, to have this event in the General Assembly of the UN. I want to share with you what we are facing now in terms of UN Security Council resolutions. There are three resolutions that we are dealing with uh, as we speak. The last one that we are dealing with today is the Palestinian resolution. We see we have the draft resolution that calls for uh, stop the illegal building in Judea and Samaria. It calls for condemning terrorism, especially terrorism of settlers against Palestinians. And there are, there are other issues on that uh, resolution. Our policy is that we are against Security Council resolution because they are not constructive. We are very happy to hear uh, the State Department spokesperson yesterday saying very clearly that uh, it will not be discussed. But today we heard uh, an unofficial source from the White House that said that everything is on the table. So I was asked uh, if I am worried by the Israeli media. And I said, I'm getting paid to be worried. Uh, until today, we had a very uh, close and strong relationship with the American mission. And uh, I know that uh, the US administration is standing with Israel, and all of the victories I mentioned to you, we were uh, successful because of the partnership with the Americans, and I believe that we will get uh, the support also in blocking those resolutions. The second initiative is an initiative coming from New Zealand that calls both sides to resume uh, negotiations. Uh, I told my colleague, the ambassador from New Zealand, 
So if you want to call, let's sit down and negotiate. What will be the benefit of such a resolution? And the third resolution came from France. It changed. Today, they do, they do not push a Security Council resolution. Today, France, they're calling for an international conference. The new Ministry of Foreign Affairs nominated a new envoy to deal with that. He came, he met me here in New York, he flew to DC, and we are waiting to, to see what will be the recommendation of, of the envoy. But the approach of Israel, that we are willing to go back to the negotiation room, we do not need another resolution that will call us to do it. I'm sure you know that and you heard that, but in the last seven years, do you know how many hours Prime Minister Netanyahu spent with President Abbas? Any ideas? Seven years. No more. It was six. Six hours. Two meetings. That's it. When you buy an apartment, you, you negotiate more than six hours. So th that's the reality we face today. And then uh, on Monday, we have another uh, Security Council meeting uh, about the situation in the Middle East. And I, I'm sure we will hear the Palestinians blaming Israel uh, almost about everything. And we will focus about the issue of incitement. And we will tell them, stop the incitement and come back to the negotiation room. Coming from uh, the government of Israel, some people ask me if it's easier or harder to be uh, an ambassador here at the UN. So I think it is challenging, but uh, I can tell you that uh, being the ambassador of Israel, it gives me a lot of pride. And uh, some of you know me when I was uh, a student. And uh, I always remember uh, about the times when Prime Minister Netanyahu was the ambassador here in New York. Some of you worked with you also when he was the ambassador to the UN. And uh, when he, he was here, he had the chance to go see the Rabbi Milubavitch and to speak with him about uh, the UN. And the Rabbi told him something very smart. He told him, you are entering a house of lies. You should light one candle and people will see it from afar. And that's what I am doing today. I'm, I'm lighting the candle, and I'm happy that we have uh, partners, and we have the Jewish organization that uh, stand with us, support us. It is important. It is important because I know it. I know it and I feel it, that sometimes people come and speak with us because we are together, we are strong. I will give you an example. Uh, as we speak uh, now at the UN, people who want to be the next Secretary General are presenting their platform in front of the General Assembly. And it's very interesting. We ask them questions, they answer to us. It's very interesting dialogue. But everybody wants to meet, to meet us. And I tell to some of the candidates, listen, we are not at the Security Council yet. But that Hashem, <laughs> uh, we will be there. By the way, we are, we are running for the Security Council in 2018. And we will need your support on that as well. We are not there yet, so why you are coming to us? And they say, yes, you know, we are not there, but Israel is very active here at the UN. We hear you all the time, we see you everywhere, and also all the Jewish organizations here in New York are very, very active. And I think it's good. I think it's good that they, they think like that, and, and they want our opinion and our involvement, and we should be proud of it. We should be proud that people think highly uh, of the Jewish people. And I will conclude with a story. When I was a minister of science and technology, a uh, delegation from China came to meet me. And I held a meeting in my office in Jerusalem. And I told me, Minister Danone, we came here to Israel to invest in the Israeli technology. I told them, it's great. We're very happy, but please be more specific about it. You want to invest in, in biotech, cybersecurity. You know, we have a lot of things we can offer you. And they told me, we do not care. Whatever is Jewish, we want to buy. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, and they bought a lot uh, after uh, this visit. So yes, we, we, are, we are proud of our uh, capabilities, of our achievements, and uh, we need to stand together in the UN. We need to continue to partner with the Jewish organizations. Your involvement is crucial for us. And without naming names, but sometimes when, when something happens at the UN, and I'm as the, as the ambassador 
I decide uh, to condemn or to, to send a press release, I know that some people wait to see what will be the response of the Jewish organizations. I do not call you and tell you, listen, do that. You are, you are leaders. You know, you think for yourself, and you know what to do according to your values. But people are looking at that. And I was amazed to see that someone, an official, very important one, came to me told me, yes, I saw your statement, but you know what? I saw only three organizations, and he knew before me which organizations put the statement, and who did it first, who did it second. So I understood that they are following it. They are not following only what we, the government of Israel, uh, are saying. They are following what you are uh, saying, what you are tweeting, what you are sending a press release. And for us, it is very important that uh, you will speak up and uh, we will do the things uh, which is right for the Jewish people and for the state of Israel. As a former politician, and maybe a future politician, I can speak forever, but uh, I want uh, also to hear you and uh, to conduct uh, the dialogue with you. But I just want to tell you that I'm very happy to have the partnership <laughs> with my good friends here. Toda Raba. So, questions of the ambassador, Mort? Uh, hi, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, first of all, even during the 10-month freeze, Abbas refused to sit down and negotiate, even then. <laughs> and uh, Frank once told us not to use the word incitement. We should say promotion of a culture of hatred and violence. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> my, uh, you have to breathe between <laughs> uh, My question is, I'm very worried, <laughs> not as much as you are, but I'm very worried about a potential UN resolution uh, establishing a Palestinian state within certain borders without Israel's input in any way, shape, or form. Is this a real possibility, and how would the State Department Obama respond to such a resolution at the UN? Let's take a few questions. Sure. Other questions? The, the issue clearly at the UN, at the podium, the General Assembly of Security Council, already there are going to be 2021 20, resolutions against Israel before opening doors. The question is what happens in the halls and the bilaterals, if, with, specifically with the countries in South America, Africa, Asia. What, what kind of relationships do you have that uh, speak volumes and more than, than anything else than besides what's heard from the podiums? Jerry? Uh, Cassandra, I want to piggyback on that, on that question. Uh, we, we've been told that there is a thorn of relationships between Israel and Saudi or the, um, UAE. Are you feeling the same thing in the UN in your relationship with these countries? Last question, Ken. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, given the fact that the UN has been taken over by the forces of evil, can you think of three reasons why the United Nations should not be closed down? <laughs> First of all, he gets paid, you know, to be there. Not by the UN. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I, I think uh, if you could. Sure, thank you. First of all, Maud, the issue of the Security Council resolution is, is a major issue. If I need to put priorities, what I do first, that is the first priority. That's what I'm doing. You know, we talk with the ambassadors, we, we speak with the capitals, and uh, basically the Palestinians understand that uh, you have elections in the U.S. They understand that the Secretary General uh, will not be here next year, and they're trying to push something before. Uh, I know that you are very busy with your own politics, and uh, I will not get involved in the politics. Just I will mention that you know many people in this room came to me for many years and told me you have you need to do a reform in your electorate system in Israel. <laughs> so now uh, I'm not sure. I, I want to listen to your ideas anymore about uh, changing the system in Israel. Uh, but uh, we care a lot what will happen until the end of the year. You speak a lot what will happen after the elections, what will happen uh, in 2017. We care a lot what will happen in the next few months because we see the pressure coming. And basically, the, the president will decide about it. He, he can decide until uh, the end of the year whether there will be a veto uh, or not. In 2011, the Palestinians pushed a resolution to the Security Council. Out of the 15 uh, states, 14 supported the resolution, and the U.S. vetoed it. So uh, for us, it is an important issue. Uh, we raise it when, when we speak with our colleagues in D.C. and here in New York, but uh, the U.N. is very dynamic. It's very dynamic, and uh, I, I believe 
that the U.S. will do what is good for the U.S. and Israel, and supporting such a resolution is not good for the U.S. and Israel. Rabbi, regarding the gap between the bilateral relations and what's happening in the U.N., you are absolutely right. And the Prime Minister, which uh, lucky for me is also the Minister of Foreign Affairs, because if you speak with my predecessors, it was very hard for them to report to the Prime Minister and to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. <coughs> so usually, you know, who you call first, like who you, to who you give the information first. There was a lot of dynamics for me that the Prime Minister is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he was the ambassador here, uh, it makes life easier for me. But we, he, say it, he says it publicly, that it's not enough to have bilateral relations with Israel, we want their votes here in the UN. And you see so many leaders coming to Israel to meet with us, to share technology, uh, to sign agreements. We are now starting to develop uh, and to expect them to, and I don't want to name names, but we see some changes. We see some changes uh, from different countries that understand that, you know, we want to help and support them, but we expect them more here in the UN. The Arab countries, first of all, yes, there is a change. You know, you spoke here in this room for hours about the Iran deal. One good thing that came out from the Iran deal that we got closer to the, to the moderate Arab countries. Don't misunderstand me. If I could choose that there would be no Iran deal, I, I would be there. But this is a situation today. But there is a big gap between the leadership and the people. Take Egypt, for example. We cooperate with Egypt, fighting together radical forces in the Sinai Peninsula. Still, the people in Egypt, when you saw what happened to the member of parliament who met with the new Israeli ambassador to Cairo, he, he was physically attacked in the parliament and he was kicked out of Congress, out of the parliament for five years. There is a, there is a big gap, so we should do it uh, quietly and we are doing it. Ken, the last issue of closing the UN, I do not support it. I, I agree with you that <coughs> some countries are trying to take over. And if you look at the principles of the UN and, and, the, and the founders of the UN, the idea was a good idea. You need to take the UN back to where it's supposed to be, which is promoting dialogue, promoting peace, supporting the needed, and, and not to condemn Israel every day. And, and there are some other issues at the UN that they should be changed. So I expect, and I say to my colleagues in the US and in, in Europe, Australia, they should be more involved and they should demand more. They should demand more from the UN and not just giving the money and say, that's it. Let's uh, pray for, for a better UN. So they can demand more. And for us, it is important that the UN will be much more effective. Uh, and I will conclude what's happening in today in the border between Israel and Lebanon is the best example of that. Ten years ago, we passed a resolution 1701 <coughs> that said that Hezbollah should not be armed in southern Lebanon. And we see what's happening. It's only a matter of time until the next conflict. They're giving up. And you have more than 10,000 UN troops today the uniform forces in southern Lebanon. So if you ask me today, would you like to see the forces going back to the region countries? No. I want them to be in southern Lebanon, but I want them to be more effective. I want them to, to do more. So that's what I, I would say about the UN. We want the UN to be here, but we want the UN to be much more effective. So if there are no further questions, Mr. Ambassador, Thank you, as always. Hag Sameach to you and your yeah. family. I want to wish all of you, the first time I'm wishing Hag Sameach uh, publicly, Hag Pesach uh, Sameach to you and to your families. Thank you very much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, 
to Jim, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.